Sure. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Happy Friday. Uh, uh, and again, wherever you may be joining us. Uh, my name is Daniel Diaz Nilsson. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I serve as the director for the Office of Diversity Outreach and Development here uh, at Kent State University in the College of Education, Health and Human Services. So um, thanks for coming to Second Fridays. Uh, so the EHHS Second Fridays has been in existence actually now for almost three full years. Um, and it's really served uh, for our college and actually we've extended it to our, our friends and family uh, outside of the college, uh, the university and our community to really think about how we can provide opportunities for engagement, for education, for learning uh, uh, on a variety of different topics, but uh, really centered in DEI and B, so diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging. And so uh, we're really excited about kind of the collaboration between DOD or the Diversity Outreach and Development and the uh, Gerald Reed Center, which Dr. Amanda Johnson will We'll share in a second. And when I pass the mic, uh, Dr. Johnson, I will take over the waiting room. Uh, so you have a chance to not only introduce yourself in the center. Um, and we really are excited about, again, thinking about DEI and how uh, that and international education are one and the same and not always separate. And I think our speaker will be able to help bring us through uh, some of the conversations in education with that too. So with that, I'm going to stop talking because I think my minute is up. Um, so Dr. Amanda Johnson, uh, if you don't mind. You can take sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for um, joining uh, Daniel and I's first time co-hosting an EHHS Second Friday. We're really excited about the topic. It's one that's not really discussed enough. Um, it was recently announced as International Educator uh, Magazine about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in international education. So we're so happy to follow that up with our esteemed colleague today, Dr. Gerardo Blanco. Um, he is an associate professor of higher education and the academic director of the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College, one of the best programs in the States. He is also a Fulbright specialist and an advisor for programs and global initiatives at the American Council on Education. You'll often see him um, all over uh, the news. He'll be for recently, I believe he was in Ecuador and Colombia working with uh, universities there on their internationalization strategies. So he knows a lot about this topic and we're really excited to have him today to meet with you all and talk about, like I said, something really important, that which is just not discussed, discussed enough. So I'd like to pass this on over to Dr. Blanco. Um, and there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon. I'm so honored and so grateful for this opportunity. Thank you, Amanda, for that very kind introduction. And thank you, Amanda and Daniel, for inviting me to join uh, this wonderful initiative. I was, uh, first of all, very impressed uh, that there is this kind of initiative uh, in, in your college and also thinking right about how we can come together about issues that we feel passionate about. I won't hide my passion for this topic and I hope that that will invite us to have a conversation that hopefully will translate into action because that's really the purpose of having these opportunities to come together. I also must say, I'm so impressed that anything happens on a Friday. I feel very often we're so used to having those not being times for community and I really applaud uh, this initiative and I feel um, just in such community uh, with each of you and I really look forward to having a dialogue uh, and there will be an interactive component. I promise this won't be a session where I just talk at you the whole time. And I really, um, I really think that's what uh, is very important, right? That, that we use these spaces that we currently have available to talk about issues that sometimes are uh, difficult to discuss, that we do so by creating uh, environments that are safe for dialogue and I want to invite that spirit precisely, right? That, that let's lean into risk and discomfort as we're having these conversations. So I really wanted to start, um, um, and I still remember how to do a screen share, here we go. Uh, you know, these are some of the things that uh, of the pandemic, one of the legacies of the pandemic, um, right? These like hybrid approaches and what a wonderful opportunity to be able to connect uh, across distance. But I precisely, I want um, to focus on this connecting across distance because I thought that um, 
one of the topics that I think we still need to continue discussing is precisely this intersection of DEI and internationalization. But of course, we could go in many different directions with this topic. And in this sense, what my hope would be is to address how racialization impacts um, international academic mobility. And I'll try to unpack um, what this means for me and what this means for the work that we that we are trying to do. But before I wanted to do that, I wanted to be also intentional with how, uh, with the visuals, right, of my presentation. So this is a 2016 painting by the Puerto Rican artist, Angel Cora. And um, uh, this uh, painting is entitled En Fuga. And it really has inspired me to think about this. So I just invite you to take a look at the screen for a moment uh, and, you know, just, just see what you notice, right? Like see, uh, um, I think one of the things that to me stands out um, is like the, the suitcases, the diversity of clothing of the people who are depicted. But I don't know if you picture kind of like in the middle to the right, um, there is a figure in like kind of white pants and like a lilac blouse. I don't know if you are noticing, but this person is wearing a mortar board, right? Like one of these graduation caps. And I think that's one of the things that caught my eye when I saw this painting live and then I had to take a picture because you never know when you're going to be giving a presentation about the intersections of DEI and internationalization. Um, so for me, uh, this is a deeply personal, and here I wanted to zoom more, and you can see that it's a, it's a picture of a painting, right? Because you can see the canvas, you can see the paint. Um, but this is a very deeply, um, deeply personal topic for me. It's really at the core of my own values. It's also at the core of the values that we aspire to uphold in the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College. Um, but in my experience and in my observation, DEI and internationalization are usually uh, existing on our campuses as separate structures with different histories. But my argument for all of you today is that they, uh, while traditionally they are uh, in different structures, there is high potential for collaboration. And that is our hope in this session, right? That we can find some of those areas that we can connect with each other and that we can find ways to move forward on your campus, but also beyond. Since I know we have um, colleagues from different institutions represented here, and I think that is um, truly, truly wonderful. But also um, a part of my argument is that if there isn't quite always a shared uh, set of values, there is at least a compatible set of values that could connect work between DEI and internationalization. All that we need to do, my argument is, is having a process of translation and of dialogue. And I think, um, I hope that that uh, will become one of the takeaways from uh, today's presentation and dialogue uh, with each other. Um, so what do I, uh, what am I referring to when I talk about these parallel structures on our campuses? Um, and I know the terminology is constantly changing. So I'm referring here to DEI plus. Sometimes we have uh, J for justice at the end. Sometimes in a slightly cheeky way, we add the J in the beginning so that it's like Jedi, uh, you know, like in Star Wars. So here I'm using the plus because I want to leave the space. Um, uh, I want to leave some room for understanding that these structures and these uh, expressions that we use and the terminology that we use is not fixed, but is subject to change. But here I wanted to compare and contrast DEI and internationalization and what I see as some of the challenges, but also some of the opportunities. Um, and perhaps sort of what are some of the conditions that have led us to the uh, structures that we currently have. So first of all, um, you know, my observation is that many of the current structures that we have for DEI on our campuses 
are in one way or another a response to student activism and to campus protests, right? Uh, and we know the late 1960s and 1970s were a time of turmoil on um, US campuses. Uh, and I think in most of the institutions that were around at the time, we can find uh, some legacy or some vestiges of some history of students uh, occupying areas on campus, demanding rights, especially for uh, Black students, but also where significant populations of Latinx students were present. We can see that. And this legacy, by the way, is very noticeable uh, on some of our campuses. For example, uh, for the longest time, um, rather, um, I started my career at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and something that the administration building has is very unique. There is this secret stairwell um, that connects the, of the president's office with the exterior of the building. And the idea is that that uh, stairwell was designed into the building, uh, right, as, as, part of, uh, as part of the building, because uh, it was built post-1960s. So the idea is they anticipated that if the students staged a sit-in, the president and the provost and uh, administrators would, would, should have an exit path. Right, um, so that they wouldn't be trapped if there was a protest or um, takeover of the building. What I'm trying to say is that the physical and administrative structures of our campuses today are in many ways influenced by that history. Right, so 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 that's sort of that initial uh, understanding of DEI initiatives on our campuses. In contrast, internationalization while higher education has always been international, right? We can go back to the first universities in the world and they involve itinerant faculty, right? Like going across Europe, teaching in one university and making different stops in others and sort of like that flow of students was always taken for granted. However, the efforts of internationalization that we know today are generally connected with the most recent process of globalization. In this sense, uh, the general agreements on trades and services, um, these free trade agreements and thinking of education as a service that could be exported. These are all ideas from the 1990s have really created many of the structures that we have today. So this already is giving us some signs about how and why these two structures have been parallel without too many intersections, unless we create those intersections intentionally. In terms of ideological perspectives or influences, there are also significant um, uh, contrasts here. So DEI has in many ways been influenced and these are overlapping, but there is a tendency over time, first to talk about diversity, uh, certainly there was a moment, um, usually when many of the structures and multicultural centers and multicultural uh, offices that we know today, um, the, the, the influences, right, about how we think about this work uh, really centered multiculturalism. Uh, of course, now that's a term that continues to be contested and problematized useful term, but also with implications that, um, that we need to be critical of. And more recently, uh, this work has been much and more, uh, much more explicitly um, influenced by social justice, right? Notions of social justice, but now we are in new moments, right? Where this is in many ways being fragmented and we talk about anti-racism, anti-sexism, and so on and so forth. In contrast, internationalization work has been primarily influenced right, by fields of intercultural communication and more recently about post-colonial theory and conversations of decolonizing the university. As you can see, these are not incompatible um, uh, languages. 
However, there are differences. And I really think it's very important that we recognize that our colleagues on the other side, whatever side that could be, um, simply have been exposed to a different set of perspectives, to a different set of theories. And then it's our job finding some common ground. And I'll provide a few examples of what I see promising areas for creating and finding uh, such common ground. Now in practice, right, what do these structures look like? Well, in my experience and in, in, in my analysis, I find that many of the initiatives in the, uh, for DEI on our campuses tend to be closely connected with student interfacing offices. Um, student affairs is one of those uh, many spaces, right? Many col uh, college and university campuses have divisions of multicultural student affairs, multicultural office. Uh, at the University of Connecticut, where I work, um, they have cultural centers. Uh, but in a way, that student facing work, because of that history of activism, is very important. It also tends to have a component around human resources with offices of equity and inclusion, right? Institutional equity, uh, ensuring op uh, equal opportunity in hiring and so on, right? But it tends to be in a way concentrated. Many of these programs, uh, I'm not saying that they're isolated in uh, pockets on campus, but they tend to be concentrated with certain functions. In contrast, for internationalization, what we find is that internationalization work tends to have a very strong academic component in many ways, like area studies um, tend to be uh, one of the areas, not only where a lot of this work of internationalization comes from, or even the field of geography and so on, but we also know that many of the senior international officers on our campus tend to come from the faculty of some of these programs, international relations, political science, uh, and so on, right? So uh, that academic focus is very strong. Also, there has been historically a compliance focus, right? That is, that is very strong. And sometimes we talk about the securitization of international education. This is in many ways, the legacy of 9-11 and the idea, right, that international students uh, could become a national security threat. Uh, this is uh, in many ways reflected in, in the structures of the federal government where international education functions in the federal government are distributed across the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of State in the sense of diplomacy and international relations, but also the Department of Education. This makes us very unique, but it also makes our field very complex in the practice, right? So, um, and, and we can see that a lot of the work that we do with uh, area studies, as I was referring to earlier, with education abroad, with services to international students, tends to have very often that compliance system, right? So in study, uh, in uh, education abroad, there is a strong um, emphasis on uh, safety uh, and say, uh, sort of risk mitigation or management, but also compliance. And I think um, these are some of the concerns that in a way keep us on separate tracks. And I think um, this, I hope that this, is an, that this analysis is somewhat helpful to begin mapping. It is not intended to be super systematic and applicable to all campuses, but this has been my experience working across different institutional types with different levels of orientation towards research and teaching. Um, but I think it helps explain why it's not always that we find each other, and by that I mean colleagues who work in DEI or on internationalization work, we don't always find ourselves on the same meetings or on the same spaces on campus, right? Unless, of course, there is a search committee and then we get invited to collaborate. Sometimes the academic programs also allow us for that cross-pollination. 
but so far, as you can see, there are distinct, uh, distinct uh, ideas, influences, and in areas of work. Not to mention, there are distinct professional organizations, uh, distinct conferences that we go to. So there are not always very many opportunities uh, to cross uh, to cross collaborate. But I had promised that this was uh, something deeply personal that I feel very passionate about. So I did want to take a moment to reflect about my own experience. Um, I'm a relatively new American, having become a U.S. citizen in 2018. And I came to the United States as an international student first. So my identity um, has been morphing along with my personal journey. And I always, uh, when I teach, uh, uh, when I have the opportunity to teach um, on topics of social justice and diversity, I like to say that I became, or I first began feeling like a person of color uh, in 2005 when I came to the United States. That doesn't mean, right, that my phenotype changed in any way. It simply meant that the identities that were more salient for me changed significantly because of the context, right? So I think for me, the idea of social construction of identities is very important. And I recognize that it's not only how I identify myself, but it also matters the labels that others place on me. And very often I have no control over those, right? So, but I think for me being both and at times feeling more like um, uh, like an international student and uh, little by little feeling more like an immigrant. I don't know exactly where I felt that that transition happened, but it happened, right? I see myself now in a different way, but also my experience, my first experience on campus as I was uh, a graduate student at the University of Maine, which uh, if you are not familiar with the context is uh, one of the least racially diverse um, states in the United States, right? So I always would have uh, questions like the one I have here on the slide. So should I go to the international coffee hour, right? Which was always a space for community uh, that I felt I very much belonged or and to the Latin American Student Association, which, which was also an important space, right? But I think very often, um, the more I have become a practitioner in the field of international education, and as I have the privilege of teaching on these topics, I think these um, dichotomies are often imposed on our students, right? And I really think it's very important to think about the different ways that we make all of these spaces more welcoming to all students. And I think that's, um, as I mentioned, this is very personal, very uh, something I feel very passionate about, but it's something that I have only um, uh, been able to understand through reflection about my own experiences, about the ways I connect with others and about my own practice, right? All of this work informs my work as an educator and as somebody that, um, that helps the, with the formation of international educators in the making. Um, so what are some of the key concepts and challenges that I wanted us all to bear with, to reflect about, and hopefully to identify opportunities for cross collaboration? Uh, the academic literature uh, on international higher education has talked about a few concepts, right? So for example, the, notions, the notion of centers and peripheries and how, whether we utilize global north and global south, whether we utilize perhaps different levels of income like the World Bank does, right? Like middle, uh, lower middle income countries, higher income countries and so on and so forth, try and in an effort of being more neutral, but in a way that there is some form of center and periphery. Uh, and I have been learning more and more recently about 
majority world and minority world uh, spaces, right? Uh, really making us think that some of the resources that we assume in the consumption of resources that we have in spaces of the global north places in a very small minority. Um, but sort of these notions of centers and peripheries have been long established in the field of international education and uh, particularly uh, also in international higher education. How, when we talk about academic mobility, we very often also talk about push and pull factors. And these are concepts that of course are widely utilized and in many ways very useful, but to me, given the experience I was discussing just a moment ago, they can feel a little frustrating because they don't always highlight the human agency element, right? Like I'm not a push or pull factor, right? Like I'm a, I'm a whole person and I think about our students as full people as well with complex lives and relationships and family lives and aspirations and dreams. Uh, and these theories, of course, no theory can capture all of that complexity. Uh, but also the concept of brain drain has been among us in many different ways. And it has been problem, uh, excuse me, it has been problematized in many different ways too, because what does it say for those uh, individuals that remain in their home countries? That doesn't mean that they don't have intellectual um, prowess to share with the world. It also doesn't mean that those who have experienced academic mobility are only brains or only intellectual um, intellectual resources. Like I said earlier, we are full people with complex relationships um, that, that these labels and theories do not capture. But all of these concepts and others have been influencing how we practice internationalization on our campuses. Uh, as well, it's more, re more recently, it has become salient how international, mo international mobility patterns tend to follow all colonial routes, uh, and more recently also neo-imperialist relations. And I think that's a very important consideration to have. Uh, this is the more critical turn in the academic field of international education, right? Uh, and how, for example, the aspirations, uh, the educational aspirations of students in the Global South tend to be influenced, at least in part, by some of these colonial legacies. And I think this is something that we need to contend with, that we need to make sense of. And in some ways, we need to prepare our students, right, to analyze critically those elements as well, right? Like we need to do in a way um, an awareness raising as to why is a degree from a particular country uh, that may have a colonial legacy in one's home context? Why is it so important? Why does it carry uh, such, an, uh, such a significant space, right? How much of that is reality? How much of that is myth? And what is the price, right, um, that we need to pay for obtaining that. And this is not to say that we need to slow down or stop these mobility patterns, but rather we need to analyze them carefully. And I think it's very important that we help ourselves and help our students to be more um, uh, clear-eyed about the decisions that we are making. In this sense, I think it's also very important that we think about, and um, this is, I think, um, really connected to the core of this conversation with um, how international students and scholars on our campuses become racialized, right? Uh, and I was saying this earlier, it only matters so much how you see yourself, how others perceive you and how others categorize you influences right your own experience and i think in this sense we could have many examples in the united states and beyond about how this experience of racialization influences um, the experiences of international students and scholars so just to use a few relatively recent examples 
We know certainly that in the US context, many Asian uh, international students were stigmatized, lab uh, labeled, and in many cases, um, victims of violence, whether physical or verbal, um, because of the discourses that were around in society, right, blaming um, uh, Chinese and Chinese American populations for the pandemic. And this had some very real consequences. At the time, I was the faculty director of a living learning community with an international focus at the University of Connecticut. And um, I had students, international students, who encountered um, some of these instances of discrimination and bias. However, I also wanted in some of these examples to highlight that in the beginning of the pandemic in China, there were, um, and, and it's important here uh, to note that China has a significant, a, a truly massive international student population. Many of them are African students and many others are coming from what um, uh, China has determined to call um, the Belt and Road, right? Sort of the old Silk Road. Uh, so this huge infrastructure and communication project and therefore um, many countries of Central and South Asia are part of this Belt and Road and therefore many of those students have pursued an education in China. But during the very early months of the pandemic, there were rumors spread uh, in China that it was African immigrants, including students, that were uh, accelerating the spread of the pandemic. So they had their own version of these biased, uh, racialized ideas. Uh, but also we have seen in a completely different and more recent crisis, uh, with Ukraine and with the embrace of displaced students, um, you know, because because of the of the uh, Russian invasion, but it became very clear that African students, many of whom were pursuing medical education in Ukraine, were not receiving the same level of care and support. And I think this should be something that confronts us all. So these are just examples from the US and beyond of how racialization uh, is manifested also in international academic mobility and that there are some important implications for all of us, right? To, um, to grapple with these, with these challenges. But also, and I think this is something that's moving us away from the crisis conversation and more into the everyday and what can we do about, is this notion that international students are ill-equipped uh, as I was and yet thrusted into racial dynamics on campus. And this is not to say, by the way, that we should make it an expectation, much less a requirement, uh, for international students to become experts on issues that we have not yet figured out, even those who have been living in this country for a long time, but rather that we need to invite them. And I also would, would advance uh, the idea here that very often international students will be reluctant to engage and who wouldn't be reluctant. We have a bit of a mess, right? This is very challenging. This is very difficult to do. But I also think it's very important that in our mission as educators, we invite engagement, right? And um, encouraging and recognizing that it's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel risky for international students and scholars, but it, there is indeed a lot that we can learn from each other with um, their questions, right? And by helping us identify things that we take for granted, they could really help us make sense of these realities, but also they could develop through critical analysis, some tools so that wherever, wherever they go next, they can engage with some of these challenging uh, conversations as well. And here I wanted to provide an image once again. This, by the way, is an image that I learned in school and in conversations with other Latin American colleagues. Um, and there is, a, there, there is a point that I want to make. 
Uh, the point that I want to make is that many of the racial and ethnic um, divides and assumptions that we have today are the legacy of colonialism. Uh, this legacy may not always be uh, evident, and that's why I always like to talk about it as a device for conversation. But what you see on the image on the left uh, side of the screen is a typology, a very detailed typology of the kind of um, the, the word in Spanish, uh, which is the language I, I learned this, um, this language of of race and ethnicity in my uh, initial socialization process is a caste or casta, right? This sounds a lot like the caste system in South Asia, um, but this caste system was based on race and based on different, or rather the makeup, the composition of different um, uh, racial groups in uh, Spanish, colonies across the American continent. And the notion was that there, these um, racial compositions needed to be policed very carefully because individuals uh, would be uh, entitled to different rights and to different uh, privileges according to this racial composition. And um, as you can see, there is a large complexity. This is only part of the picture. Um, but the whole idea was that, um, that the different racial groups that uh, the parents would have would have significant implications for their children. And those would be passed on depending on you know, who they would be having children with and so on and so forth. But with the point that I'm trying to make um, for uh, higher education today is that when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion work and internationalization work, very often we seem to have a divide and conquer approach or a, z or a zero sum uh, approach, right? Very often when we think about budget allocations for programming and for different areas of the university, this uh, zero sum mentality can really creep into how we relate with each other, how we work with each other. And my argument is that um, these approaches, these zero sum approaches end up upholding white supremacy on our campuses. And I wanted to just um, sort of provide a few examples, right? Uh, of how I think this is manifested in the work of our higher education institution. Very often, uh, in conversation, right, with colleagues who work in DEI spaces, they say things like, well, it's really good that we are recruiting international students and they provide, uh, of course, you know, a richness to the institution, but our priority should be uh, promoting, for example, pipelines for domestic students of color, right? Like, so there is that dichotomy of how uh, local students and international students are understood. It's always, right, very important. And this ongoing question influences a lot of our work. What rights should international students have as non-citizens on our campus? Not only non-citizens at the moment, but to obtain a student visa, you need to declare that you have no intention to remain, right? Like you need to be by definition, um, an alien in the immigration sense of the word. Uh, at the same time, right, uh, should, uh, and this, I present these as legitimate questions that I have encountered in candid conversations with colleagues, should international students benefit from activism that they often do not contribute to? Right, a lot of the spaces that we have, as I mentioned earlier, talking about the history of DEI has been uh, the result of student activism, right? And of course, how should the benefits um, be distributed on our campuses? But on the other hand too, we know that international students are much less, are far less likely to approach mental health services on our campus, for instance. And are they not in some ways subsidizing with their fees and tuition 
services that they are very unlikely to access or benefit from. And also, and this is really coming to a head in the coming months, where should international students fit in admission and financial aid policies and decisions? And I'm thinking, of course, about the role um, that the Supreme Court case about affirmative action uh, and how that's going to uh, trickle down to our respective campuses. And we know that in many ways, international students too have been part of the conversation, particularly advancing the argument that they are often discriminated against in some uh, uh, particular highly selective institution. So what are some very briefly, uh, some of the spaces where I am noticing some opportunities um, for change, for dialogue and for collaboration. First of all, I, I think um, I have been very encouraged by how the ACE model for comprehensive internationalization has been rethought and that now it has a particular area that focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion in all of the aspects, right? So in this model that you see here, the outer, the outer uh, ring in the lighter blue is supposed to be used as lenses that help us understand actions for internationalization within. So diversity, equity, and inclusion is then considered a lens to understanding everything that we do, whether that's partnerships, mobility, or uh, our institutional commitment and policy toward internationalization. I see this as a very encouraging area, but still something that we need to continue working on. I also think, uh, and, and this is important to me, um, it's, I think it's very important that we recognize uh, opportunities for dialogue and that we also recognize, uh, not only recognize them, but that, but that we engage in those. And, I, I really like to engage in some form of dialogical uh, approach in the work and facilitation that I do, but I have found that very often approaches to dialogue can be siloed as well, right? So for example, I, uh, I have practiced intergroup dialogue as a particular way to improve um, interracial and other intercultural relations in the US context. But also uh, in the more in the international edu education world, we have these sto story circles methodology that follows a very particular approach to facilitated dialogue that frankly reminds me a lot of intergroup dialogue. Uh, but if you have ever also facilitated a world cafe, uh, you probably would find some of these similarities. So to me, this is also another area of opportunity for action, right? That we may want to have a dialogue of dialogue approaches and that we find ways to work together regardless of what label we are using. Uh, I think there's something really powerful in coming together and exploring differences and similarities in our experience. Uh, so whether we call it story circles, facilitated intergroup dialogue, or any other approach, I think that can be an area that both DEI practitioners and uh, internationalization practitioners could really share. And in fact, there could be a lot of space for improvement and refinement in this sense. And also I think that living learning communities can be a space um, that have because they have a residential and an academic component, I think this could really be an important space for dialogue across difference, for collaboration, but also to create a sense of community with each other. So this is, a, 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 as I mentioned earlier, something I feel very, very passionate about. Uh, there are some additional resources that we can find a way for me to share with all of you. Some of these are um, um, sort of tr more traditional, uh, others are less traditional publications. The chapter at the bottom is in open access. So it's just uh, very easy to, to get. 
but this is a topic that I have been thinking and reflecting about and conducting research for my entire career. And I just feel uh, so privileged for the opportunity to exchange some of these ideas with all of you.